going to break the rules and use the stand here. All right, thank you. All right, it's good to be with you. I'm honored to have uh, my wife, Jenny, and my parents here with me also uh, up in the front row, near the front row by Pastor and Sue. And uh, we're grateful to be here. And uh, my wife and I were smiling when we saw this date on the calendar because it was about six months ago that we came here and recall with fondness just the love that you gave us. And uh, we had a wonderful time with you last time. So we pray for that, but more importantly, we pray that we lift the name of Jesus nice and high here today. And so uh, it's a privilege to be with you. I'm going to open in a word of prayer if that's all right. Lord, uh, we do thank you and we lift you, Father, Son, and Spirit, and we uh, would just pray that your glory would shine forth. And uh, even as we speak here today, Lord, I pray that... Um, you would go straight to the heart. You'd go past our, our physical ears and go uh, to the depths of who we are and uh, just speak to us individually and collectively. And uh, Lord, we love you so much. It's an incredible thing that we are free indeed uh, before you and that the work between us and you is finished. You uh, have done it all and we are humbly bowed before you. Thanks for this precious place called Parkside. And thank you for what you're doing and what you have yet to do here. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, a special shout out to Dan and Skyler because uh, they have been great friends to us from even though we're downtown. Uh, I've, seems like I talk to Dan almost weekly about something or the other. And uh, last Thursday night, I got done counseling. Skyler, it sounds like I'm ringing pretty good. Do I need to drop this a little bit? Okay. Uh, last Thursday evening, I got done counseling a couple and um, and could smell fried chicken in the shelter. And so I ran up to third floor and there was the Parkside group uh, finishing a chicken feed. And so thank you guys for what you're doing with that also and your partnership in ministry with Open House. I've been at Open House now for four years and uh, uh, it's been some of the richest years of my life. And uh, that is just the intersection of where God has placed us uh, in the middle of a, 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 a tremendous ministry. And Open House Ministries is a Christ-centered, life-restoring family shelter ministry. And we apply the gospel of Jesus Christ to end homelessness in Clark County. And that sounds like a great, great big bill uh, to cover, but uh, it really, really works of being a Christ-centered organization that cares for families and their children who are homeless. And God has allowed us the privilege of having about 31 families in shelter at any given time, and their families with children under the age of 18, and their families that are homeless from, for any variety of reasons. You can imagine some and some you cannot imagine, but they're exactly like you and I that it just happened. Life happened and they found themselves homeless and we're fortunate enough to have the resources to be able to take care of them. The sad part of that is we have 31 families in shelter and right now we have 35 families waiting for shelter and they can wait four, five, six months to get into our shelter. Uh, additionally, when a family is with us, they are there for almost a year, and during that time we insist that uh, the adults use their time well. And since most of our adults are not in gainful full-time work at that point, we ask them to be a part of classes Monday through Friday, basically that would go 25 to 30 hours a week of, of classes of all sorts whether they're Bible studies or chapel or counseling or case management or finances or whatever it will be, we have found that we can create an environment that teaches and reteaches and trains and mentors these young men and women. And uh, I'll say more about that in a little bit, about what we see happening in front of us. But all that to say, having a Christ-centered model, uh, God steps in and changes lives. And uh, that's our prayer every day. And if you take one thing away from here today, I'd say take home um, uh, our need for your prayers. <laughs> because it's really God who is the mover and the shaker, and he's the one that ch transforms lives. But we see lives changing, and it's a great, a great thing to be a part of that. Um, we're doing our part to end homelessness in the county, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we go. 
Part of what makes it work there, I think, is that, that the, the themes of what we see going on in people's lives are similar to the themes that go throughout the Bible. That the Bible's themes are really creation, fall, rescue, restoration. Creation, fall, rescue, and restoration. And we see that at the shelter, that we get people somewhere in proximity to a fall. Because nobody ever dreams of growing up and living in a homeless shelter. And so it's a downer to have to be in shelter on some level, and yet we see it as providence that God allows things together for a, a brief time where we can be together and, and look pretty closely at life. And routinely, uh, God steps in and provides a rescue for our families and does incredible things of a lot of different uh, types. And he is the one who's the restorer. And so in a word, that's how this works with our, our, our mission and vision of, of trying to end homelessness is Christ steps into life, God steps into life, God changes hearts and people are transformed and then they are a part of transforming the world around them. And so that's just a word or so about, about open house ministries. So how does, how does it go uh, then? How does that make a dent in homelessness is entirely that families just like ours go out into their spheres of influence and project hope and hopefulness out of, out of where they've come from. And so all of a sudden there is a reason for hope that is, is shared with people in their spheres of influence. And all of a sudden we have a, a hopeful environment going forward as people leave our shelter. Some people remain involved with our shelter for another one or two years after their first year so they could be with us for one or two or three years, all told. But in the end we are hopeful and they are hopeful in sharing where that hope has come from. That's really um, imperative uh, as we go forward. I want to talk today, I want to get uh, into scripture specifically and, and then weave some open house thoughts into it. And in a minute I want to share from Luke 10. And in Luke 10, um, there's several images of Jesus in action. And part of one of the images, Jesus seeking those who are far away. And another uh, image we'll see is Jesus saving. And then another image that we'll see is Jesus stretching, and uh, stretching us, that is. And I want to say, uh, say a few words about each of those things. Um, in Luke 10, verses 1 through 3, Jesus is out uh, in the countryside sharing the good news. And what he does in Luke 10, verses 1, I'll just read the first three verses. He says this, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Pause there for a moment. Jesus had his inner group of 12 apostles, which we are all familiar with. But then outside of that, in a concentric circle, had many, many disciples and followers and apprentices that were now being sent out. And he sent out 72, two by two, into various villages and towns to precede him, to herald the coming of Jesus Christ into these communities. And he, uh, in one sense, we can imagine that that could be us, right? that that could be us going out two by two into Camas, Washougal, wherever it is. It could be us at open house going out and heralding the good news of Jesus Christ. But Jesus goes on to say, he says that the, the fields are white unto harvest and, and that they are ready to be um, harvested, but the workers are few. And there's another place in John 4 where there's the similar, almost exact wording is used. And in that instance where Jesus is at, he's at the well in Samaria uh, with the Samaritan woman. And he and her talk for a while and she runs off to tell her townspeople that she's met a man that knows everything about me. This might just be the Messiah. And she runs and tells the village mates about this guy who's at the well. And the Bible says, and in my mind's eye, I see the crest of this hill with people just thronging towards Jesus. And he uses this, these words later to say, the, white, the fields are white for harvest. 
And when a, a wheat field is white for harvest, it's time. It's not kind of thinking about it. It's time that the people are thronging in to the Messiah. Now, it's pretty striking that Jesus, first of all, you know that Jesus was in Samaria with Samaritans. They were viewed as half-breeds. The reason why is years before the Assyrians had invaded and conquered Samaria, deported many of them, then the Assyrians and the Samaritan people had inbred together and produced half-breed children, and then they imported them back into Samaria. It was a way of, of uh, it was a cruel way of tampering with, with that that nation. And so from that point on, the Jews couldn't stand the Samaritans, and the Samaritans could not stand the Jews. And then you have Jesus go straight unto the Samaritans. And he talks with the woman at the well at Sychar, who hadn't been married once, had been married five times. Five different men in her life. Searching for truth, searching for meaning. And Jesus, probably in a five-minute conversation of what we see, he goes straight to the heart of the issue and, and talks to her about her life. And notice how Jesus, Son of God, fully God, fully man, in the flesh, takes time to speak to this half-breed person that a normal Jew would not, but Jesus steers into her for very good reason. And even though she tries to change the subject to talking about worship on Mount Gerizim, he knows that the issue isn't about how we worship, it's, it's about what's inside of us and what is God doing as a spirit inside of us. And the answer to her life isn't on the outside with five different men, it's on the inside. About what could God the Spirit do within a woman, within a man, to change them from the inside out. And at that point, she busts out to go get her friends, and the whole t town comes to see Jesus. And in a really, really good sense, that throng coming over the crest of the hill also could be us, couldn't it? Because once upon a time, every one of us was far away. Every Once upon a time, every one of us was thrown an angry fist to the sky. When we were sworn enemies of Jesus Christ, he died for us, every one of us. And so we were the Samaritan half-breeds once upon a time, weren't we? It fits. And look at the heart of Jesus that he loves in these exceptional ways, loves beyond the ways that the Jews would have normally loved. Jesus says a little while later, the very next, next verse, he says, I send you out as sheep among wolves. And it's a, it's a, it's a foretelling that it's not going to be easy breezy. And that we're going to stand against op opposition. And the good news is in a few verses we'll see all 72 made it back. And in fact they were filled with exceeding joy in that instance. But we can take it to heart that we are going to face opposition. And we know that today things in America are changing. And some of the changes hurt and make us sad when we see some decay going on, moral decay going on. It is said by many people that the majority of Americans no longer accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, no longer accept the God of our founding fathers as the true God. So in that sense, we almost are in a post-Christian kind of place, aren't we? And that's a hard place to be now when missionaries are being sent from other nations to America to help us get back to where we should be. I remember what Abraham Lincoln said years ago. He said, we are never more than 30 years away from being a godless nation. And what he was hitting on was that there is a point here where, where the moment we fail to raise our children in the fear and admonition of the one true God and His Son, Jesus Christ, at that point we've lost something incredible, haven't we? And those are the times in which we live that we are almost passing a generation by often in the fear and admonition of, of God Almighty. So, a little while later, the 72 come back with rejoicing to Jesus about the reception that they've received. And then in verse 21 of Luke 10, Jesus says this. He says, I thank you, Father. He's praying out loud. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and the understanding and have revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. 
Isn't that cool? That God's heart in through Jesus Christ is one to give the message to the hungry people. The people that aren't, don't have it all figured out on their own, but the people that are hungry for the truth of what He has. And really, when you look at it, that, that's us again, isn't it? That, that he, we want to be like little children that are hungry for the word that He gives us and that He teaches us how to live this thing called life. And even now, here 2,000 years later, through His living word and through His spirit, He teaches us how to live this life in America. Because you see, the problem is sometimes we will listen more to ourselves or to our culture or our, our customary ways of dealing with things and we forget God's counsel and coaching on how do we live, how do we love, how do we do this thing called life. So it's super imperative that we find these times and places like you have here at Parkside where we sharpen each other inside the church walls. It's super important that we do these things outside the church walls. George Barna said just a few years ago that right now 80% of any given community will never go to any church. And when I heard that, it kept me awake because I was a pastor. <laughs> And if that's somewhat true, if it's remotely true, it should keep us awake. Because what it says is 20% of a community is in the four walls, 80% are outside. How, how in the world can we impact that? And it's through Parkside going forth and you guys touching people and places like you do at Open House. At Open House, we believe it's so important to get our adults together and to teach and to train them in the fear and admonition of God and, and to go through Bible studies and mentoring and, and talking about God through Bible classes because many of our young people have never had it. I talk to people routinely that have never had a godly upbringing and they're just trying to figure it out. And even though I feel young at heart, I have to recognize that any one of these people could be my children. And now it's kind of I'm in a role where I have a hand in teaching and training some of these young people in things that they did not receive once upon a time. The advantages I had of being raised in a Christian home, some of these kids just don't have. And I think that the magic of what happens how these people can be receptive to the truth that is before them is via the broken heart. And I know in my own life, I wish it was not so. I wish I would have learned lessons easier in my own life. But I learned most of my lessons through the broken heart. And the image in my mind eye is that my heart cracking open through the pain of my own stupidity or sinfulness or whatever it was and that there's the opportunity to, for God himself to pour himself into my heart, into the hearts of the people at Open House, into our hearts if we will but let him. Romans 5 says that. Romans 5 says the love of God is poured within our hearts. Hope is poured within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's given to us. And that hope in there does not disappoint us. That God is faithful to work in broken hearts. I want to share just briefly about a family named uh, Tony and Carly. And I share their names because they gave me permission to speak about them this morning. Tony's 25 years old. His fiance, Carly, is 20 years old. They've lived at Open House for a year. And Tony and Carly have a son from another relationship of Tony's before Carly was around. And that son uh, was in the custody of. Child Protective Services. But they, Tony and Carly, had another son that they, uh, that they were raising. But about nine months ago, Tony and Carly got their son back from Child Protective Services by being at Open House. And, and the community agencies know that when a family's at Open House, in that structured environment, receiving teaching and training and accountability and mentoring, that generally things are going to go well. So this family got their son back, and that was incredible. But a, a word about Tony. Tony never had the advantages that I had. 
Uh, Tony has never met his birth father. His birth father's in prison in Florida. Remains in prison in Florida. Never met his father. Tony is a man that if he walked in, you would probably say he's dark. He's a dark individual. Dark in countenance, sullen in, care, in, in, in his appearance. Uh, he says to me, he says, Mark, I was raised pagan, white supremacist, drugs, alcohol. Um, every, there were no rules whatsoever. And Tony has struggled almost his entire life. Um, however, he started coming to at open house. This past Saturday, Tony graduated. It was probably one of his zenith moments is that he graduated with his GED from Clark College. It was a, it was a beautiful thing. But the great crescendo was about two months ago because Tony had been wrestling with God and I, I felt all the way along that it was a spiritual struggle with Tony. And about two months ago, he came to me and started talking to me about being a father figure in his life. He says, I, Mark, I've never had a man in my life. You're like a father to me. Shortly after that, Tony was in a Bible study with about, <laughs> about half of this many people in it and sitting around a table. And Tony was pretty shy. But we started talking about generational sin somehow, about how the sins of a father can come into the gen next generation, the next generation, and before you know it, you look just like what was passed on to you, and you're pretty, it's pretty possible you'll pass it right on to your children. And Tony s stopped and drew attention to himself, and he said, enough is enough. This has to stop with me. Because if I continue the way I am, I'm going to pass that right on to my children and they're going to be just like me. It was about a week later that Tony accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. A week later, he was in the Washougal River being baptized and uh, Tony is doing exceedingly well. And, and how I see it, it's one of the, the high points for me and for our ministry. Is I, I was listening to a pastor who said, there is no greater power on earth than when a man comes from death to life. There's no power greater than when a dead man comes alive. And that's exactly what has happened with Tony. And I would ask you to pray for him. And I've said to my wife, I said, he's lived 25 years one way, and he's lived 25 days another way. And it's time that the body of Christ walks with this young man and teaches him how to be a man of God. Jesus seeks through those last scriptures that I read with you. I want to spend a few minutes going forward into Luke 10 where Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Verse 25 of Luke 10 says this, Behold, a lawyer stood up to put Jesus to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And the man answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, You've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Do this and you will live. Incredible words. The lawyer was not our kind of lawyer. The lawyer was, a, was a, probably a, 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 an expert in biblical law. The law, the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, he probably knew verbatim. And yet he comes to put Jesus to the test to see if Jesus has, has his answers for this guy about what shall I do to inherit eternal life. And then when Jesus asks him what he thinks he knows the, the law to say, he says the great commandment, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, just, just do that and you will live. But there's a great big problem. The Jews already knew that to do the law was impossible. To do the 613 rules of the law was more than any man could do. And Jesus knew that full well also, that Jesus came in order to fulfill the law so that, that that's a burden that humanity could not carry. So Jesus had brought it down into that great commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Problem is we can't do that either, can we? 
Not one of us is fully able to love the Lord that way and love our neighbors that way. And Jesus knows that. He knows it's not something that we can just pull out of our hat. And so Jesus has come to put, put it right in front of us that he's asking us more than we can possibly do. And the beauty of it is on one hand, he comes to, to be the perfect fulfillment of the law. That when we even then, whether then or now, look at Jesus Christ, fully God and fully man, we see him as the, the complete fulfillment of the law. We can look at him 2,000 years later and say he is the perfect personification of filling the great commandment. So Jesus came to do what we could not do. He covers what we cannot do. And what he does is says, if you will believe that I have fulfilled the law for you, I will take your real solid sin and give you my real solid righteousness. And then we're sitting there with real solid sin saying, you tell me that you're going to take my sin and I can have your righteousness. And it's the great exchange, isn't it? That if we will recognize that we cannot do it, but he can, we can be saved also. And I say that to you here today because that's what gathers us together is the fact that Jesus saves. But that's also the fact of what makes open house work is that Jesus saves. Let me introduce you to another family named Randy and Lori. Randy and Lori did not know Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. They are a couple 40-ish, a man and a woman, husband and a wife that are raising their grandchildren have three little grandchildren, so they're parenting all over again. When they came to Open House Ministries, they did not know Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. And via Living Hope Church, Living Hope does a very good job of reaching out to people that are unchurched. Via Living Hope Church, they came to accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. Great people, but greatly lost until that time. And I say that to you because if Randy and Lori were here, you'd just love them. They're the, some of the most lovely people in the world. But a few weeks after they accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior and were baptized at Living Hope, Lori's brother got very, very sick from a lifetime of alcohol poisoning. And Randy and Lori shared their faith, their newfound faith in Jesus Christ with that sphere of influence that they had that was nobody else's but theirs. And they shared one, they shared one weekend with her brother and he went to Living Hope Church. And this brother made a profession for Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. It was a heartfelt thing and was baptized the next week and a week later he was dead. And so once again at the funeral, Randy and Lori are at the funeral and the testimony of a life saved, albeit very late in life, was incredible. That if Randy and Lori had not heeded the call to get right with God through the great exchange with Jesus Christ, um, things would have been very, very different. And so all of a sudden we had a funeral that had 150 people and I worked with homeless people all the time. I worked downtown Vancouver. But this was another group of people that were very, very... Uh, the fields were white for harvest. They were white for harvest. You had a room full of people that had been, as far as I could see, completely unreached. But it was the death of an alcoholic who came to know the truth of Jesus Christ that touched this room of 150 people. Incredible things. Years ago, I had the privilege of working in, in, in psych. I worked in psych units for seven years. And early on, by God's providence, He allowed me to have a, an image of a time and a place. I can remember the table. I can remember where I was sitting. And there was a man sitting across from me whose name was Chester. Chronically horrifically depressed. And I was a young pup. And yet God put it in my heart very, very early, but for the grace of God, so go you. But for the grace of God, switch places. But for the grace of God, how would you like to be handled if it was you? 
And so a part of this message today is, is about the incredible love of God for us, but part of it is also our to have the heart of Christ as we go forth because the fields are white with harvest. And there are people dying all around us. And what it does for me is it reminds me that I am always accountable for the hope that is within me. Because I never know who I'm going to touch. Part of what I do at Open House Ministries is I, uh, uh, I'm busy at the shelter, but then I volunteer three days a week at our bicycle shop. I have a tremendous bicycle shop, and I can't advertise during this message, but it's a great bicycle shop. <laughs> and I love it. Part of the reason is even though we're in downtown and we get a lot of street people at the bicycle shop, we get a whole other clientele. The people in shelter I know fairly well, but the people on the streets I get to know through the bicycle shop because they're always pouring in with trouble. And, and you get a chance to deal with them. And I was working last evening at the bicycle shop and I thought, I got an idea. And I, I looked at this piece of equipment sitting there and that's that little dangly thing that hangs on the back of your shifter bike. Can you see it? That is a multi-speed derailleur. And a derailleur is a funky word, a funky French word. I don't know why Americans call them derailleurs. I think it's more of a limiter. Because all it really does, and I, I'm a bike mechanic over there, so all it really does is hangs on the back of a shifting bike under tension with a chain going through it, and there's two limits on it. So it's a limiter. There's a low limit and a high limit. And all you do is say, this far and no further shall you go. This far and no further shall you go. And we say, you can play in between, but this far and no further. That's all it is. Don't let them charge you too much to work on these, okay? That's all there is to it. But when you think about it, isn't it a little bit, of, I think it's a little bit like our lives. Is that we end up kind of saying, this is my life, <laughs> here's my low limit, here's my high limit, I'm going to play in here happily, and this far and no further shall I go. And I think part of what Jesus is saying to us is when he says the fields are white with harvest, I'm going to do the great exchange with you so that you, Mark Roskam, though you are worthy, <laughs> on your own merit, you have none, you are worthy of death. But because of what I've done for you, when God looks at you, he sees you dressed in white, would you go forth as one of my 72, and would you be pleased enough to represent me in some pretty unusual places? And I want you to open up the limiter, and instead of boxing it in, I want you to learn how to love out here, instead of in our safety zone. When Jenny and I lived in Colorado, we were pastoring there, we were doing great, we were in a community where most people try to retire. And it would have been very predictable for us just to hang there. And yet God was turning our hearts about blowing open the limits. And part of what God did to get us to Vancouver and get me to open house was saying, you've got to love outside the limits. You know how to love inside the limits just fine. But I want to have you out here on the edges. Because that's where the people are dying. And I charge you Parkside. I already know you got the heart. I charge you individually just to say, where am I boxing God in? It's a little bit of dust doing this, and it's a little bit of telling God what our, the box of our life is going to look like, isn't it? We put, a, put God in a box. If Randy and Lori had boxed things in, you can see what would happen. And multiples of people would never have been touched with the truth. Last things here. The last verses of this section I want to share with you is about how Jesus stretches. And it's the story of the Good Samaritan. And I'm going to read it. You know it. I'm going to read it. And we'll talk about it for a few minutes. So this uh, lawyer, seeking to justify himself, said to Jesus, So who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest 
was going down that road. And when he saw the man suffering, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out money and gave it to the innkeeper saying, take care of him and, when it, and whatever more you spend I will repay you when I come back. So now, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And the lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. So that descent, 17 mile descent from Jerusalem to Jericho was a dangerous road. And that really could be a type of the life that we can face is dangerous roads of going down these dangerous roads of life. And the two people who could have been expected to lend a hand did not. And we can only speculate on what was going through their mind. Probably had things to do and places to go and needed to stay clean to do that. But the one person who got involved was that half-breed Samaritan guy again. The Samaritans who the Jews thought there was nothing good in them and and yet it was the Samaritan who pulled off and offered compassion and that word compassion literally co-passioned with the victim. That he suffered with the victim beside that road. So the question is, who's the good neighbor? And we know that we know from this story, we're so familiar with this story, we know that the good Samaritan is the good neighbor. But I think the, the, what happens is we often look out and try to define who our neighbors are and all the while the question is, am I a good neighbor? Not who's my neighbor. And the question is, is not who's out there that, that you know, God might have me dirty my hands with, but am I a good neighbor? And am I willing to let love lie outside the box and to open up my limits and say, am I being a good neighbor and am I willing to be inconvenienced with whomever that might be? I know I, I, I struggle with these things too. And I struggle with good intentions. But like Ken Geyer said, the smallest act of kindness is better than the greatest, the greatest of best intentions. And so it's a rally call, I hope, today for all of us to be reminded that the smallest act of kindness is a wonderful thing. And are we good neighbors? I had a professor in seminary that said, our conduct towards others is the best barometer of the spiritual condition of our hearts. It's not how much time do I spend in private devotion necessarily. That's a huge part of it. But he would say, the best barometer of my spiritual condition is my heart attitude towards others. And that's a, that's a great big charge for us, isn't it? To learn how to love outside the box and love as Jesus would love. And so once again, we live, kind of end where we started, that the story of life in America these days is creation, fall, rescue, restoration. And we live in a very badly fallen culture right now that's struggling terribly and needs us badly to reflect Jesus Christ. I think the word Christian was only used a couple times in the Bible. And it was more of a post-biblical kind of term that came into meaning little Christs. And can we be the little Christ that America desperately needs these days? I want to thank you, Parkside, for the opportunity to be here, but also thank you that I know you guys are people that get your hands dirty. And I appreciate that, to have dirty hands and clean hearts, because mercy 
is messy. And love is messy. But thank you for your love and support. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, Pastor, whoever's going to close this up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. That was great. And uh, I bet we all...